All right, my friends, we are back for the second half of part of lecture eight for Thursday, May 21st, I think. Thursday, May 21st. Yep, so this is part two. Uh, hopefully be about uh, 20 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, and then we will... Um, we will be all set for this week. Okay, uh, let me know if you have any comments, questions, concerns. As, as usual, leave a comment below. Everybody, one comment below. Something you learned, something you found insightful, something you saw in the reading that we didn't talk about. Uh, and make sure you read some of the comments. I know you're like, Brother Smith, I didn't want to do this. This wasn't part of the syllabus. I know, and hopefully it doesn't kill you. Uh, but it, there, it is really nice to have that interaction and to... Uh, be able to have someone comment on your comment, right? Um, and to uh, just have that human kind of back and forth. Uh, I think that would be uh, really good and kind of, you know, never done this before. So uh, we're kind of have to introduce that mid term. But again, shouldn't take you too long. Uh, shouldn't be a, you know, super, super difficult for you. Okay. Uh, you are BYU students. Uh, and you, I could ask you to do <laughs> you students are amazing. Okay, so let's um, let's share our screen here and go to. We just finished the uh, uh, our individual look at the Gospel of Luke, and now we're going to look at John. I'm going to remind you of this. I think we talked about this earlier, right? That if you were to put Mark on stage, if you were to put Matthew with your Jewish audience. Uh, down on the floor, if you were to put Luke with his Gentile audience down on the floor as well, uh, then you have nowhere else to sit for the Gospel of John. You've sat everywhere, right? Uh, and John is going to be totally and completely different. John is going to put us on stage. We're going to go backstage. We're going to see the Savior in individual conversations. We haven't seen that really. There's been a couple of moments like where he talks to that Gentile woman, and there's a couple of, you know, four or five verses of their back and forth. But these, the Gospel of John is going to give us long conversations between Jesus and one other person, right? Um, Jesus and Nicodemus, uh, Jesus and the woman at the well, um, Jesus and Pilate, uh, lots of long conversations between Jesus and a very, uh, others in a private setting. Now, when it comes to John, you need to understand that John is most notable for what it does not contain. All right. So if I was going to ask you, you know, what's uh, what makes John different than all the others? It's that it does not contain. Um, look at the second paragraph here. John's record is notable for what it does not contain. Wonder where I got that. For example, it, there's no mention of Jesus's 40 day experience in the wilderness. Nothing about the Mount of Transfiguration, which is a huge event. Right. Uh, not a single parable in the in the Gospel of John. Nothing about casting out evil spirits. So who's he writing to? Let's go to the first paragraph. Uh, it's evident that he is writing to members of the church who already have basic information about the Lord. So uh, many New Testament scholars believe that John is writing to people he already knows have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and perhaps other records. And so the idea is that I'm going, John feels like he's going to fill in the gaps. Here's everything you don't know. Uh, you know, in a couple of moments, he connects it to things that they would already know. And then he goes off, you know, he adds five chapters to the Last Supper. The Last Supper in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's, you know, a couple of verses, and he adds five chapters to the Last Supper. Uh, in his early life, he's a fisherman, right, as Peter and Andrew and his brother uh, James. Uh, he refers to himself in his gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? That's how I write in my journal, uh, you know, the BYU professor that Jesus loved best. Um, and uh, we, we can talk later about John not dying, but living on the earth. Uh, oh, back in the, the last sentence of that first paragraph, you'll want to look at that one. John's purpose, right? Matthew's purpose was to tie Jesus to the great Jews of the past, Moses, David, Abraham right? Uh, Mark's purpose was to show a very active savior uh, and to record his story and succinctly. Luke was to show that we have a universal savior here, uh, a universal messiah, 
but he didn't just come for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles as well. But John is different. Look at John's primary purpose is to emphasize the divine nature of Jesus as the begotten son of God in the flesh. So this isn't the idea of he's a, the Messiah or he's active or he's uh, the Messiah for Jews and Gentiles, right? Those are all good, but he's going to make it much bigger. He's going to say, no, this man, uh, Jesus is God. Uh, John is by far our most theological gospel. It's definitely the one that expands our view of Jesus in our theology as Christians. Uh, take a look. You can kind of see the, the fill in the gap idea. Uh, you see the on the top of the columns, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you see that? And then on the left-hand side is like the the story about Jesus. So you can kind of see, let's see if I can use the little laser pointer here, the little pen. You can kind of see places where Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write about something. And then who writes? John. <laughs> right? You see that? It's just John. John will include some things, right? There's some things included about John uh, that he includes from those stories. But really, it's let me fill in what you don't know. Same thing over here, right? So here's Matthew, Mark, and Luke writing, right? And here is John all by himself. And here is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And of course, John's like, oh yeah, that did happen. And let me expand. That's the Last Supper right there. So hopefully you can kind of see this synoptics versus John. Synoptics versus John. Um, that's uh, uh, that's going to be how it works uh, throughout, you know, the his entire gospel. All right. Oh, wait. Stop sharing. Sorry. Let's get back up there. Okay, um, let's go then and look at uh, Logos. Where is my, my Bible is over on the chair. So let's, uh, how come this is doing this? Uh, discard those and go back to Zoom. Sorry, I'm going to pause real quick and go grab the, um, my Bible sitting back there. Okay, Bible in hand, here we go. Uh, let's go to John chapter 1 and look at the idea of Logos. All right, so uh, let's do screen share. Here we go, John chapter 1. Let's look at Logos. So uh, if you go to John chapter 1, notice that John begins with John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning. In the beginning, you guys, that's Genesis chapter 1. You, he's, he's definitely channeling um, Jewish scripture, and the book of Genesis is the story about God, right, in the beginning. So uh, you can see what he's doing here. Um, uh, think of Star Wars, right? They have their specific way of starting, and you know it's a Star Wars movie because of the way it begins. Well, it's the same way here. John is tapping into how Genesis, the book of Genesis, begins. The story of God, how it begins, and him creating the earth. And he's going to kind of uh, parallel it, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So um, the, the, the Greek word here for word, so in the beginning was the Word, would read like this in Greek. In the beginning was the Logos. Um, and that was translated into English as word. So what is logos? In the beginning was the logos. Uh, you can read right off the slide here. The idea of the logos is a Greek thought. Now, how long have they had Greek influence in the Holy Land uh, before John, you know, before Jesus, right? You know that. Uh, all the way back to Alexander the Great and then being, you know, in the middle of the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic empires, right? Um, they all speak Greek. Uh, it's been you know, hundreds of years uh, since they've become basically a Greek society. Um, and it's, it hasn't been very recently have the Romans come in, right? I mean, recently as in like, when did Rome place Herod as king? Can you give me a date on that somewhere close? Yeah, about 40 years before Christ is born. So it's uh, still a very Greek um, civilization that they're in. So they would have been taught Greek, some Greece, Greek philosophy and, and heard of it. So it's a Greek idea that goes all the way back to 600 um, BC. Uh, and it's this idea that uh, the, the Greeks, um, you know, their philosophers, they looked around at the universe and um, at the regular movement of the seasons and 
they looked around at okay uh, all these you know look there's such a there's there's a lot of order here to the universe um, so we we've we can't ignore that so we're gonna have to call it something and they called it logos they said uh, it's it's what is in everything and through everything and gives organization to us as human beings and our intellect and to the planets and the stars. There's something organizing all this. Now we would call it God, right? But they didn't call it God. They called it the logos. Um, so now they started to, um, it says later, the Stoics uh, define the logos as kind of our rational and spiritual we would call it maybe the light of Christ. Um, you know, uh, speaking of Star Wars, um, the logo sounds all like the force, doesn't it? Um, look at this. They called the logos providence, nature, God, and the soul of the universe. It's in all things. It permeates all reality. So those of you who are Star Wars fans, you, uh, this is the logos. Now, so John is, do you see John saying, okay, in the beginning was the logos. If you're a Greek, if you're a Greek, you know, thinking and you're, you're a Christian of John's day, you're, you're becoming a Christian, right? We talked about how um, they, they begin to divide Judaism and Christianity begin to divide after, after Christ and just takes a couple of decades and pretty soon. Uh, they, they're very different religions, right? Where back when Jesus was on the earth or just been resurrected, they were very close to each other. They were breaking apart. And so here you are on this side, you're becoming more of a Christian than a Jew. Um, and you know, this idea of logos, right? Because you're, you live in a Greek uh, society. And so you know what logos is. And here's John is trying to say, okay, you know, your Christianity, you know, this Jesus that we believe in the Messiah, he's also the logos, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. They're like, wait, Logos is a being, right? That's not part of this Greek thought. So John's taking it and saying, yeah, your Christianity, the Messiah you believe in, he, and you know this Logos that you've heard about in, from your, you know, your Greek culture, philosophy, whatever, um, they're the same being. Um, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. See how we're paralleling Genesis again? In the beginning, all things were made, right? All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So that's a very theological statement that Jesus isn't just the king of the Jews, as Matthew would say. He's not just a very active um, healer, as Mark would say. He's not just a, the Messiah for Jews and Gentiles, as Luke would say. What's the first three verses of John say? John says, Jesus was God. Jesus was God. Sorry, I'm a little distracted. I can hear two of my boys fighting downstairs. All right. Um, let's keep going here. Um, and let's see what else John has to say. He's saying, in him was life and the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So we kind of get some foreshadowing here of Jesus's life in case someone's reading this for the first time. He came to give life and light and the darkness didn't accept him. Uh, verse six, there was man sent from God whose name was John. Now he's not talking about himself, John the Revelator uh, or John the Beloved, same guy. He's talking about John the Baptist, different guy. Uh, so when we think of our two Johns, think of John the Baptist, the, the one that came before Jesus, had the big following, baptized people, taught them. And then you have John the Beloved, who was a follower of John the Baptist and eventually becomes part of Christ's 12. Uh, he's going to go on to write the epistles of John, the gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. All right. Uh, he says, this man, John, came, verse 7, to bear witness of the light. Notice that's a capital L. It's actually a name for Christ now. So he's called him the Word, the Logos, and the light. Um, and he said he was not the light himself, but he was sent to bear witness of that light, the true light. Uh, so um, we, then he goes through uh, the Pharisees talking to John the Baptist. He says, who are you, basically? And he says, 
uh, I am the same. I am the person Isaiah spoke of. Prepare the way of the Lord, right? And I'm pretty sure we talked about this in this class already. But you should think of the idea of a king sending out a, a road crew in front of him to prepare the road, right? To make sure it's smooth and that it's straight, um, and that he can go where he wants to go. So you've got John leading the way, getting a following ready. Uh, and when Jesus comes, this following, this path is wide open for him. So when Jesus, when John sees Jesus in verse 29, he says, the next day, John sees Jesus coming to him. That's the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, I know it's him because, verse 32, when I baptized him, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. I knew it was him at that moment when I saw the Spirit. We talked a little bit about that earlier in the term with uh, the baptism, where we always assume that John knows who Jesus is when he baptizes him, because he says, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And now we're thinking, mm, maybe, maybe he saw him as a very righteous person. Maybe he saw him as someone who... Uh, is just more even amazing than, you know, he's like, you're, you're better than me. Uh, but maybe not that statement of, I know exactly that he's the Messiah, the son of God until later after I baptize him and I see the spirit. That's verse 32. Okay. Uh, verse 35, the next day, John still teaching. And he said to two of his disciples, that's the lamb of God. Verse 36. Look at that man right there. See Jesus walking? Behold the lamb of God. Two of the disciples heard it and they followed Jesus. Verse 37. So you can see John pushing his following to Jesus. Uh, verse 38. Then Jesus turned and saw them and said, what seek ye? So someone's following you for a little while. You're like, can I help you? And they, he, they said, where do you live? I love that. Verse 38. Where do you live? And um, he says, come and see. And they spend all day with him, right? They spend all day with him. And one of the two that heard him, his name is um, Andrew. And he is Simon Peter's brother. And he comes to Peter, verse 41. He comes to Simon. His name's not Peter yet. And he says, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. You guys, that's a big moment. That is a big moment, right? Imagine if I... If I showed up in class at BYU and I was five minutes late and I was like, you guys, um, you got to follow me. J Jesus is here. Right? That's a big moment. You'd be like, what? You wouldn't go, oh, cool. You know, let me finish this phone call or let me finish this homework assignment. No, you drop everything and go. So this is a big moment. Sometimes we read it and we're like, oh, that's cool. But think about if Peter believes Andrew, I'm not sure if he did, right? Do you believe your brother on everything? But um, I think he went, I think he would, if he does, he drops everything and he goes. And uh, it says, when he brought him to Jesus in verse 42, that's a good thing to do to your brothers, by the way. Bring them to Jesus. Let's have a come to Jesus. Verse 42, Jesus beheld him and said, you're Simon, the son of Jonah. He's never met him. You're Simon, the son of Jonah. We're going to call you Cephas. Cephas means rock. We're going to call you Peter, basically. Cephas is the Greek form of this. Uh, we're going to call you Peter. Uh, which is interpreted a stone or a rock. So we have the moment recorded in John chapter one, where Jesus meets the apostle, his, his head apostle, Peter. And the very first thing he says is, I know you, you're Simon Jonah's son. And we're going to call you rock. Interesting, right? Well, you get more, you get a couple more first meetings. Jesus, um, finds this guy named Philip, who we're going to hear later. He's one of the 12. And he says, follow me. And Philip does it. So you get, you get the feeling he's also a follower of John. And when Jesus sees him, he's like, follow me. And he's, he's in, right? Because the way has been prepared by John the Baptist. Philip finds his friend, Nathaniel, who's also becomes an apostle later. And he says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. So he's very sure that this is the Messiah of the Old Testament, right? The one that they've been prophesied of for centuries. We have found him. Um, his name is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You guys, um, Nazareth is probably not known for churning out, you know, in famous, influential people. Remember, it's up in the north. In what area? What's it called? Search the G. 
It's up in, did you get it right? It's up in Galilee. That's where Jesus is from. He's from Nazareth and it's a small town, right? It's like, can anything good come out of fill in the blank? Think of a town that doesn't have a great reputation where you are, right? Can anything good come out of there, right? Um, I don't dare say any of them because one of you is going to be from there and you're going to be very offended. Um, uh, If you go to if you go, if you live in um, Oahu, uh, BYU Hawaii um, is in a town called Laie, which is next to another town called Kahuku, and these are small little towns, right? These are kind of the backwoods of Oahu. Um, not that there is backwoods; the whole thing's gorgeous and on the beach. But um, they would think that way. Like people in Honolulu would go, "Where?" Right? Like the, the there's a true church in Laie. Can anything good come out of Laie? So that's the idea of it's like it's a small little podunk town, and uh, Nathaniel's just being honest. Now, when he sees Jesus, Jesus, so he comes with Philip. He's like, "All right, I'll meet him." And Jesus sees Nathaniel coming, and he says, "That is an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile." So in English, <laughs> that would be like me seeing uh, Sophie for the first time, and I've never met her before, and I'm like that there is a good member of the church. Now, what would Sophie say? Because she would say exactly what Nathaniel says, which is verse 48, whence knowest thou me? Or do I know you? And Jesus says, yeah, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathaniel's impressed, you guys. Look at Nathaniel, verse 49, Rabbi, you're the son of God. Whoa, that went around. For, you guys, that went from do I know you to You're the son of God in one word or one phrase. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So what's happened? My guess is that, here's my guess. Nathaniel knows, Nathaniel has had an experience and it had to do with maybe sitting under a fig tree, maybe praying under a fig tree, um, where he had an experience that he knows only he and God know about. And this man who everyone thinks is, the Messiah just just told him about that experience. So what if if, uh, a man who everyone believes, a lot of your friends believe is Jesus comes to you and says, uh, he calls you by name, right? Or he gives you a nickname like he does Peter. And he then says, I remember uh, girls camp 2015. Do you remember? You were sitting on that picnic table by yourself and you were reading section, what was it? Section 100 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And you got that particular verse. Do you remember that? And you were all by yourself, right? That sounds like what's happened here with Nathaniel because he's like, Rabbi, you're the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. And Jesus almost, it sounds like he laughs and says, behold, I, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under a fig tree, you believe me? you'll see greater things than these. It's almost like a, you ain't seen nothing yet type verse in verse 50, right? Just because I told you about that one thing you're in, man, you're great, uh, Nathaniel. You wait, you just wait. So he says, hereafter, you're going to see the heavens open. So um, do me a favor. All right. So we go back to our theater analogy. Now that we're on stage, do you see Jesus a little differently in the gospel of John? If you were to describe him, from John chapter one, what would you say? Right? He is, he's definitely different. Um, he is, uh, if you, the Jesus of John one is very, um, he's pretty bold. He seems like a people person. Uh, he's pretty outgoing. Right? Um, so I want this, I want the gospel of John to give you, to, to help you what I'm hoping is as you read that you're in being influenced in the way you see his personality. Um, and not just like the facts about him, right? In our class, we want to get to know about him. We also want to get to know him. See the difference? We want to get to know the Lord, and John's going to probably give us the best chance to do that. All right. I've, I think I've taken too much time, um, so we'll just end right here, and we'll pick up in John chapter 2 uh, for next week uh, when we start lecture 9. All right, my friends. I'll see you very soon.